From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scam. Today, we wrap up our series on the Volkswagen emission scandal. Between 2009 and 2015, the auto giant touted its diesel models as a cleaner alternative to gasoline. Using that claim, they sold nearly 11 million cars worldwide, including about half a million in the United States. But those claims were based on a lie. A lie that once uncovered, Volkswagen would scramble to cover up. After more than a year of legal wrangling, the company would pay billions of dollars in settlements and pay out $7 billion more to buy back over 350,000 cars already on American roads. Today, I'm speaking with Cynthia Giles, formerly with the Environmental Protection Agency. Giles was head of the enforcement office during the Obama administration and sat face-to-face -face with the company's CEO to negotiate a settlement. We'll talk about the lengths Volkswagen was willing to go to to cover up the scandal and learn more about the people protecting consumers when multinational companies don't play by the rules. American Scandal is sponsored by the new Audible original Bad Republican by Meghan McCain. In her debut audio memoir, Meghan McCain gives a first-hand look into the life of the conservative rebel and departing co-host of The View. You'll hear what it's like to grow up as the daughter of an American icon and to mourn his loss very publicly just one year into her tenure as co-host of America's most-watched daytime talk show. Her memoir also reveals how she handled attacks from the U.S. president and her thoughts on cancel culture, dating, and how our country treats new mothers. It's unsparingly honest, deeply relatable, and highly entertaining. Go beyond what you know about Meghan McCain from TV and your newsfeed. Visit audible.com slash badrepublican and listen now. We get support from the new podcast, Hemingway's Picasso. Stephen Coe lived many lives. He was an NFL journeyman, a male model, and one of the most well-connected smugglers in 1980s Miami. Coe collected many souvenirs from his adventures, but his most treasured bounty, a beautiful ceramic crafted by Pablo Picasso and gifted to Ernest Hemingway at the author's Cuban home. So the story goes. Lost during the Cuban Revolution, the artwork resurfaced when Coe took it as payment for a drug run financed by the notorious Pablo Escobar. Coe passed away in 2018, passing the piece down to his son, Stevie. Stevie feels he needs to complete his father's mission of selling this piece and telling Steve's cinematic life story. Is the Picasso authentic or a fraud? Was Steve Coe a big talker or a real deal smuggler? Listen to new episodes of Hemingway's Picasso every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. Cynthia Giles, welcome to American Scandal. Thanks for having me. So I, I want to start our conversation with the timeline of the scandal. Uh, in November 2006, Volkswagen executives decided to install defeat devices in their diesel models so they could compete in the U.S. It was eight years later in the spring of 2014 that the California Air Resources Board opened an inquiry into Volkswagen after a study out of West Virginia. And a year later, August 2015, that it winds up on your desk at the EPA. Was that when you first learned about this scandal? And, and when you did learn about it, what about the sheer scope of this cheat? Uh, it seems enormous. What was your reaction? Well, I was stunned. Uh, I, I've been in environmental enforcement my entire career, and I've seen a lot of bad behavior, but uh, this was really in a category all its own. Uh, we consider this to be a direct assault on the regulations that EPA has to protect people from uh, pollution from cars, and a lot of us were furious. So it was not it became immediately clear that not only was VW uh, cheating on the diesel emissions, but they'd been lying to our face about it over the prior about 18 months. Um, EPA and CARB had been doing an investigation, and they had been giving us the runaround uh, and telling us things they knew weren't true. So it seemed when we first heard about it, it seemed like it couldn't be worse. Uh, but unfortunately, it turns out that it was. Well, let's um, let's put the scale of this uh, in context. You mentioned that you've seen bad behavior before. What were previous scandals like? Well, um, it's not unusual for us to find uh, companies that are uh, engaging in reckless behavior or cutting quarters uh, and ending up uh, causing pollution that was going to harm people. But in the case of VW, what became immediately clear was that they had done this deliberately, knowingly. Uh, they were going to put people in harm's way, uh, knowing that they were doing that. And that is really shocking behavior. Let's talk about how this scandal ended up in the laps of American regulators. So the International Council on Clean Transportation in Europe tested several Volkswagens and found gaps between their certified emissions and their real-world emissions. They then gave a $70,000 grant to the University of West Virginia to test models in the U.S. What do you think compelled the Europeans to fund American studies uh, of these vehicles? Well, the origin of the study was uh, the fact that European diesel cars were not complying with the European standards. And a, a nonprofit in Europe wanted to prove that then in the United States, the cars do comply and use that information to put pressure uh, on the automakers who, who produce vehicles for the European market. So that's the origin of the West Virginia study. They tested diesel vehicles from a couple automakers, and one of those was VW. 
when they were doing the study, they expected to find that the vehicles comply. Uh, and they were surprised that there were higher emissions from the VW vehicles. And at that point, um, the West Virginia researchers called EPA and they called CARB. And that sparked an investigation by both EPA and CARB over the uh, following year. So the idea, the origin of the study was to show that in the United States, the regulators hold automakers to account on emissions. It didn't turn out how they expected, but I think it ended up proving their point more powerfully uh, than they originally thought. But regulators in America did get involved, and that's this is when you get involved as well. You were the head of the EPA's enforcement office for the Obama administration. That's correct. And it was your job to determine how Volkswagen was going to make things right. You had, of course, a lot to consider and a lot to uncover. What was this process in the beginning? Well, our immediate priority was dealing with the pollution, getting the violating cars off the road and stopping the additional pollution that those cars were emitting. We also wanted to make sure to force VW to make up for all the illegal pollution that had already occurred and find a way to redress the harm to the market for clean cars uh, that VW caused by, unbelievably, uh, marketing these polluting vehicles as green. So it was, it was very clear from the outset, uh, very quickly figured out that um, the faster we moved, the better result we were going to get. Uh, so that was our immediate priority was the pollution. Uh, in parallel, uh, of course, we also ramped up the criminal investigation. Well, let's talk about the, the remediation efforts. Volkswagen has hundreds of thousands of these cars on the road in America. It seems like pulling them off in a mass recall would be just an extraordinary event. Were you prepared to go that far that fast? From the outset, we were uh, determined that VW was going to uh, give the consumers the option to buy these cars back, either that or give them an opportunity to have them fixed if we could figure out a way uh, to fix them um, that was going to be effective. So, yes, uh, we knew that at the top of the pile of our priorities was getting those polluting vehicles off the road. Who were the people involved in these negotiations? Well, in the civil case, the negotiations started with a small meeting between the EPA administrator, Gina McCarthy, and the then uh, CEO of VW, uh, Matthias Mueller. There was a small number of us in her office. Uh, that was our first face-to-face -face interaction with the leadership of uh, VW. And at that meeting, EPA laid out a, a three-part structure to solve the pollution issues, uh, which ended up being the basis for the agreement that we ultimately reached. So it was a very small uh, number of folks uh, in the room for that initial meeting. But obviously, in a, in a case this complicated, we quickly expanded to uh, quite a large team of people, uh, which was needed to move from that January uh, initial structure to uh, the 225-page uh, technically complicated consent decree uh, that we signed in June. So the people were, for me, I was the head of the uh, team for uh, EPA. Mary Nichols uh, headed the team from the California Air Resources Board, known as CARB. John Cruden uh, led the team from DOJ. DOJ was involved because, of course, DOJ was representing EPA in court. And then, of course, there was the, the VW team, which was headed uh, for them by a member of their board uh, and their uh, general counsel of the uh, parent company. There was a separate track, of course, for the, for the criminal case. The, the people I just outlined to you were the people involved in the civil case negotiations. I'm fascinated by these initial negotiations, but I will come back to them in a, in a bit. Um, but right now, I, I want to ask you about... Um, I guess the posture of the company, because it seems like they uh, maintained their dishonesty the entire time. Because in November of 2015, just two months after the scandal came to your attention, uh, your EPA accused Volkswagen's Porsche brand of cheating as well. Uh, the company, in a statement, uh, replied that they were surprised to learn this information. Until this notice, all of our information was that the Porsche Cayenne diesel is fully compliant. That Cayenne was later recalled as well. Uh, it seems that uh, Volkswagen had been caught in something that they knew was going on. Why did they keep lying at this point? After the September notice of violation uh, that EPA had issued, EPA told VW, look, we're, we're going to test every diesel engine you're selling in the United States, every one. Tell us now, are we going to find anything else? Uh, and they assured us no. And yet, after we did the testing, uh, we found a defeat device in those larger uh, diesel engines, too, and issued a second notice of violation. Uh, even after the firestorm that followed that first notice of violation. The CEO was forced out. Uh, they didn't come clean, um, even though we would definitely find out about it. Uh, and that's also after they had repeatedly apologized and made promises to us and publicly uh, that they were going to make it right. Um, it's incomprehensible, really. I'm wondering in your interactions with Volkswagen, if you got any sense of what in the culture drove them to continually try to get out of this? Um, they've, they've been caught, and yet they, they don't tell you all the information about their other brands. Then you've discovered that they told members of their staff to do something unethical in regards to the evidence that they might have internally. What, what did they, they order their employees to do? 
Well, our uh, investigation uh, showed that the criminal conduct of VW uh, went well beyond the defeat device. Uh, there were a couple things that happened that the public, I think, is less aware of. One is that in, in the summer of 2015, after it became obvious to them, they were out of options. Uh, they were going to have to tell EPA uh, about this defeat device. Um, but before admitting it, they told the employees to delete files. Uh, we later discovered that as many as 40 employees uh, did that. So as the walls were closing in on VW, uh, they destroyed evidence. Uh, the other, the other thing um, that that emerged in the investigation is earlier in 2015, uh, when EPA and CARB were still in discussions with the company, trying to understand what what explained uh, these excess emissions that we were finding. VW said, "Oh, no problem. That's a technical issue. We can fix that. Uh, so we just need to update the software." So they did a recall. They updated the software. Uh, and we later found out that instead of solving the problem, the update made the pollution worse. Uh, so, so they doubled down on on the cheat in the midst of the conversations they were having uh, with regulators. Uh, I would say the conduct of VW in this case uh, is a really good illustration of why EPA has criminal uh, enforcement agents. American Scandal is sponsored by Up in the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois. Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1st, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. These were secrets that once uncovered would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Let's investigate these uh, negotiations with Volkswagen directly. I am uh, very interested in, in this first meeting, this first small meeting. Volkswagen executives who are startled to discover, apparently, the scandal in their midst, uh, arrive in the EPA's office. They know they're going to get a dressing down. They may or may not know the scope of the problem in their own company. They certainly act as if, in the future, that they're going to try and scuttle your attempts to fix this at every point. What was the mood in the room? These are two adversaries meeting for the first time. It was fairly tense, as you can imagine. Um, Mr. McCarthy made it very clear uh, to VW, uh, to the CEO uh, at that meeting, that EPA was going to make them do what's required uh, to fix this problem. And there was going to be a huge price tag associated with doing that. And that's how it was going to be. Um, it was apparent to me uh, from the reaction of the people on the VW side of the table uh, that they were not used to that kind of a tough uh, approach from regulators. Uh, they were uh, stunned, uh, is how they looked, stunned. Why do you think that Volkswagen had this... Uh this belief that regulators would be softer on them. If, if, if they were stunned, it's, I, I guess I am stunned that they are stunned. Do you have any insight into that? <laughs> well, that was my reaction, too. Uh, it seemed to me self-evident um, that uh, it would have been very clear that we were going to be landing on them with both feet. And um, they were, I think, not used to that in the regulatory arenas that they normally operated in. I, I would say that they initially, in these settlement discussions, uh, significantly underestimated our resolve. Uh, but uh, they figured that out uh, pretty quickly. And uh, th I think it became very clear to them that the only way uh, to resolve the case or a trial uh, was going to be to address the three-point structure that we had laid out for them in that uh, January meeting. And that in no way would we be giving them the benefit of any doubt. Can you quickly go through um, from that first meeting uh, how negotiations evolved? Certainly their posture probably changed as you learn more information. When did things really, when did the shoe really drop for them? In the first couple of meetings after that initial um, uh, meeting with Mr. McCarthy, um, where, you know, she had made it really clear to them uh, that they were going to have to make this right, whether they want to or not, and were prepared to go to court. Um, but we had also, in that meeting, um, opened the door uh, to a possible resolution and told the company that we hoped that they would use this opportunity to be forward-looking, to be bold, uh, to think big. And, and explore uh, the possibility of turning this catastrophe into something good. Uh, we, we didn't have high hopes for that um, because this was obviously a company that was under siege uh, and there was every reason to think that they would uh, be in a defensive uh, crouch. Uh, but 
uh, they did, um, after that first meeting, uh, they did decide to invest in a cleaner car future and did think ahead. Um, so uh, that that um, turnaround by VW is reflected in the settlement agreement that we ultimately reached. You mentioned that Volkswagen wasn't accustomed to uh, the sort of resolve that, that your EPA uh, presented them. I was wondering if you could tell us what power the EPA has over matters like this. It's quite a bit. I mean, you could control Volkswagen's ability to do business in the U.S. entirely in the future. Um, what, what are the boundaries of, of the EPA's power in, in instances like this? So in the summer of 2015, after a long time of VW giving EPA and CARB the runaround uh, about the explanation for these high emissions, um, EPA said to VW, look, we are not going to issue your certification uh, for your upcoming model year diesel vehicles, uh, which you need to have to sell any vehicles in the United States. We're not issuing that until we get a credible explanation uh, for these uh, high emissions. And I think that's when VW realized uh, that they were not going to be able to get away with this cheat, uh, that they were going to have to disclose it uh, to EPA and, and to CARB. Um, and, and, you know, a similar dynamic happened in in the negotiations for the civil uh, settlement, um, VW certainly understood that they need the certification from EPA to sell vehicles um, and that EPA is certainly prepared uh, to uh, deploy that if, if needed uh, to protect the public. Our objective and our charge under the federal environmental laws uh, that EPA enforces is to make sure that people comply with the law and and to remedy the harm they cause by violating. Uh, and the boundaries of, of how we do that are laid out uh, in the laws that we enforce. Um, every case is different, and uh, the remedy for any case is tailored to the facts of that case. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the behavior was so egregious and knowing and deliberate uh, and the harm so widespread um, that it was totally appropriate under under the Clean Air Act uh, for us to insist uh, that VW not only fix the cars uh, uh, or take them out of uh, commission, uh, but also remedy all the harm that they had caused by having the polluting vehicles and uh, marketing them as green when they were actually higher polluting. At the end of this process, after several negotiations and uh, uh, months and months, what was the final result? What did Volkswagen finally agree to? The final deal uh, followed the structure that we had outlined to VW in that first meeting in January. So taking the polluting cars off the road, um, offering the consumer the choice of having their vehicle bought back by the company or waiting to see if a fix uh, could be uh, decided on between EPA and the company. That was always central to EPA's uh, pollution case. The, we insisted on the buyback option uh, from day one. So that element of the agreement was estimated by VW um, to cost maybe in the vicinity of $10 billion. The second element was cutting NOx. That's the type of pollution uh, that was concerning from the um, illegal vehicles. Cutting NOx uh, by creating a fund to um, that the states could use to cut emissions from older diesel engines, uh, like trucks or buses um, that were highly polluting. School buses uh, is one great example that many states are uh, using the money to address. Um, the estimated uh, total of that was about $3 billion between the uh, the two cases, the two-liter and three-liter engine uh, cases. And this is really uh, paying off across the country uh, even today. I see stories all the time about the, this state, that state uh, is buying a lot of new, new uh, school buses uh, that are going to both reduce pollution in the community and, and reduce exposure uh, for the kids who ride them. Um, and then the third element was supporting clean cars. So VW had caused harm to the market for lower emitting vehicles in the United States by marketing these cars as green. People who were wanted to buy green or lower polluting cars uh, were buying these diesels uh, and not aware that, in fact, they were high emitting cars. So the, the third element was to right that wrong by investing in zero emission vehicle infrastructure. And that investment amount we agreed on was $2 billion. So the total for the these elements, addressing the pollution elements of the case um, by EPA and CARB was about $15 billion. The company also, uh, on a, a separate track, the company also pled to numerous uh, felonies uh, and paid civil and criminal uh, penalties, uh, $4.3 billion. And, and, of course, multiple uh, executives of VW uh, were indicted. With so many hot-button issues dividing us, finding common ground can too often feel like an impossible task. I'm Van Jones, and I've spent several years as a news commentator. So every day I hear opinions and experiences from every end of the political spectrum. But I've dedicated my life and my career to cutting through the political noise to build uncommon coalitions in pursuit of the common good. In my new Amazon original podcast, Uncommon Ground with Van Jones, we're going to explore topics that affect everybody, 
from racial inequality to climate change to prison reform. Along the way, you'll hear unique perspectives on what it takes to make meaningful change in a divided country. Because finding common ground with unexpected allies requires stepping outside of our comfort zones. Listen to Uncommon Ground on Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Volkswagen was presented with this tripartite, this three-plank option from the very beginning. And yet they... Um, they wrangle with you over the course of months, if not years. In the end, they, they are fined almost $20 billion and untold reputational harm uh, to really just agree to what you presented them in the beginning. At the end of these negotiations, did you sense any sort of contrition on the part of Volkswagen's leadership? Well, the people um, that were most involved in the perpetrating this fraud uh, were not in the room for these uh, negotiations, uh, which is a good thing uh, because uh, that would have made it a lot harder for us to put aside our anger and and find a way to repair uh, the damage. But I, I would say that uh, over the course of the settlement, we, we did outline this three-part uh, structure to VW right from the beginning. And while they initially uh, resisted that, um, I think they quickly realized that following that pathway was the only way um, to get to a settlement and not have to go to trial uh, on this case. So, so they did um, accept that three-part structure, and the remainder of the time of the uh, discussion was dealing with the incredibly complex uh, details uh, of this settlement. And we did, this is probably the most complicated uh, settlement I have ever uh, been involved in. A uh, lot of engineering details, technical complexity, um, very large, um, obviously. Um, and I, we did it in record time. So we issued the first notice of violation in September, and by the following June, um, we had this 225-page uh, consent decree. So uh, we moved uh, incredibly quickly for such an amazingly uh, complicated case. If this was the most complicated case and uh, done very quickly and done well, I was wondering if you could tell me who were, in your estimation, the heroes of this process? Who were the people who worked hard to get to this result? In my view, the heroes are the engineers at EPA, uh, led by the amazing uh, Byron Bunker, uh, to both reveal the defeat device, uh, make it very plain to VW that we were going to have no difficulty proving this case in court uh, and found a way forward uh, on the uh, technical side uh, to make this happen. So the, the EPA engineers, and then I would say also the EPA lawyers, um, who found a way to structure this very complicated uh, deal, uh, working, of course, with our colleagues at DOJ uh, to uh, bring a resolution uh, to this uh, catastrophic problem um, that was both fair uh, to the people who had been harmed and was going to provide long-term benefit uh, to the American public in the form of reduced uh, emissions uh, across the country, which we are still benefiting from today, uh, and uh, additional support for the future of uh, clean cars in America. Of course, um, unfortunately, this story is, is still not over. Uh, in early December, German prosecutors raided Volkswagen headquarters over documents related to another diesel engine, uh, the successor to the one at the heart of this scandal. So it does not seem to be ending anytime soon. But still, what lessons can we take from the chapter that you were involved in? Where do we move forward? I think there's two uh, main uh, takeaways from the U.S. experience uh, with VW. One is that government needs to be constantly updating um, uh, its approach, you need to make it harder to violate and easier to catch uh, the companies that do violate. EPA thought that we had sophisticated and rigorous testing uh, of these vehicles designed to uh, understand what the performance was going to be in the real world. Uh, after VW, uh, that uh, approach has been uh, significantly improved. It underscores, I think, that that underscores the reality that many companies do violate uh, pollution standards, including uh, the largest and best known. Uh, we, the companies are finding new and sometimes shocking ways uh, to violate these uh, standards. And the regulators have to be uh, 10 steps ahead. Uh, the other, the other um, thing that I think many people uh, took away from this uh, experience is the importance of tough enforcement uh, as an essential part of effective regulation. The companies need to know that if they violate and put people's health at risk, uh, that the government has both the ability and the will uh, to hold them accountable. I think we made uh, a lot of people in the U.S. and other around the world, I think we made a lot of people uh, believers about that. During this process, you were clearly highly involved, but it's not just work for you. This is probably a field you've chosen to be passionate about. Um, so I was wondering, what what was your worst day in this process? I, the worst day was probably the first day. Uh, when, when I found out about uh, VW having engaged in this behavior, uh, we like to think we like to think that uh, 
And many people do think that the largest companies uh, would not do this kind of thing. Um, my experience, of course, as an enforcer has been, yeah, a lot of companies do bad things. Um, but VW had presented itself as ahead of the pack on pollution controls, uh, as, a, as a company that believed in clean cars. Uh, so it was particularly uh, upsetting and enraging uh, to see that they had presented that face to the public while they had uh, lied directly uh, to us about what they were actually doing. So that was um, a, a discouraging and uh, upsetting uh, day. Uh, but uh, very quickly, we turned from, all right, that happened. Um, we're going to make this right. Uh, and I, we head down. Uh, we're going to make this thing happen. And we uh, worked hard from that day all the way to the end. Well, the reciprocal question would obviously be, what was your best day? What Was it the end result? Um, the best day, I, I would say, was an internal day when after several meetings and back and forth with the company, we understood that the company was going to accept the structure that we uh, had laid out. And now we were just going to talk about how to get there uh, and how big. OK, so that was obviously uh, a, a big point of contention, how big uh, were, were the numbers going to be in each of these categories. Uh, but once we uh, got over the threshold of, yep, these are the these are the things that have to happen. It's got to be a buyback. You're going to have to pay to reduce NOx. You're going to have to fix the harm to the market. Um, uh, that's when I thought, OK, this could really happen. And what did that make you feel? Um, like we were going to succeed in doing what our job is, as uh, the government of protecting people. Uh, we're going to succeed in taking this horrible uh, violation and the shocking behavior of this company um, and turn it into something that uh, would benefit uh, people all across the country. Uh, that's why the people at EPA come to work every day. Uh, that's their motivation. That's what they're there to do. Uh, and and to understand that we were going to be able to do that um, was, uh, that's why we do it. Cynthia Giles, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for inviting me. That was my conversation with Cynthia Giles, head of the enforcement office at the EPA during the Obama administration. Next on American Scandal, Lenny Bruce was a stand-up comedian known for his withering social commentary and racy rhetoric. But in the 1960s, his humor earned the attention of not just national audiences, but local police. And soon he found himself on trial, charged with performing obscene material. They were charges that could land him in jail. His case raised profound questions about the limits of free speech, and it would change how America looked at its artists and performers. From Wondery, this is American Scandal. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I have two other podcasts you might like, American History Tellers and American Elections Wicked Game. Search for them and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening right now. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. By supporting our sponsors, you help us offer this show to you for free. And if you do like this show, one of the best ways you can show your appreciation is to give us a five-star rating and leave a review. I always love to know your thoughts. Detailed reviews are one of the best ways for others to find the show. Tell your friends and family and show them how to subscribe. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Sound designed by Derek Barrons. This episode produced by Austin Cross. The Volkswagen Emission Series was written by Hannibal Diaz, edited by Christina Malsberger. Produced by Gabe Ribbon. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.